that uh, that are language issues, and uh, and I think some of them are uh, are difficult to entirely uh, surmount, if you like. Um, the other one, which is probably less uh, less seen as a it's related to language, but it's it's expertise that uh, when we're talking to a, a, a diverse community as we have in terms of the technical development and the state of internet development and human resource development across a region like the Asia Pacific, there is a huge range of, of a variety of e expertise. And again, as I mentioned before, the uh, on whom on who is it incumbent to actually really do the extra work to uh, to provide access at that level? And I think. We take some, a certain amount of responsibility for that, and we do uh, quite a lot of cross-subsidised training, but we won't ever go as far as we'd like to. So uh, I think it's an imperfect world. It's one that's always improving. Uh, we would always be listening to uh, to the stakeholders and trying to get some best, uh, some idea of the best way to spend limited resources, the best way to prioritise one particular uh, new development or one particular change over, over others. And that, that in itself, I hope, is done in a fairly consultative and, and open uh, manner uh, as well. Thanks. Um, thanks, Hans, and then Thomas. <coughs> um, thank you. I, I think it's a quite interesting question with regard to participation, and it's not uh, very easy to answer, as we just heard. Uh, I, I, I think it, it's related uh, not only to uh, the cost of providing uh, the, the relevant website is also a question of resources and a question of know-how from uh, the pe people that, that are interested in, in accessing the information. In uh, the Aarhus, uh, in the case of the Aarhus Convention, we've tried to solve part of this problem by creating so-called clearing houses, where we have a kind of a, a website where we can uh, disseminate and receive information related to uh, the Oris Convention and, and also that provides a huge uh, bank of information and, 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 and also be used for information and educational services. Obviously also uh, how we can use internet for, for voting and going forward. Uh, there is a number of standards, institutes and bodies that are already using internet for voting. Yeah. Thomas, you wanted to react. Thank you. Um, I also want, uh, wanted to react to what the lady of, of Diplo ha has been saying. Uh, in fact, uh, I also think that this is an is a enormously valuable exercise that, that, that the three uh, partners here are doing here. Because, I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about a, a code of, of practice, whatever, which is kind of like good governance or uh, an example how to, how to discuss good governance with regard to internet governance. I mean, we have good governance uh, discussions on when it comes to public health, when it comes to traffic, to whatever. Uh, so we should also have some kind of mechanisms to, to discuss on national and global level what is good governance with regard to internet, govern uh, internet governance. And the way you normally understand good governance, or in, in, uh, the way I understand is that you uh, try to be transparent to those who, who are governed, to those who, who use the, the infrastructure that you're trying to govern, uh, uh, and, and that they they understand it, the way that the decisions are taken, who is taking decisions, that they have at, uh, at least some kind of understanding of what's going on so that they are able to, to tell to those people what, what they need or what, what they want. And so I think it's, 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 it's a historical fact or it's, it's a fact that, that the internet is a highly technical and complex issue and this is probably also at least part of the reason why the internet governance institutions are, are complex and, and, and difficult. But nevertheless, if you take good governance serious, you have to try to explain to, to kind of normally intelligent people like, like politicians or, or people uh, in, in the street or internet users what this is about, what the consequences of, your, of the, the decision that internet governance mechanisms uh, are taking, what the consequences are for those people if, if you take this serious. So, so I think the Aarhus Convention with, with, with the, the, the provisions on informing people and, 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 and having a dialogue uh, on, on, on access to information and, and access to structures, I think it's a very useful start to, 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 to actually see where we are with regard to internet governance. And of course, I, I say it again, it's, it's a very complex uh, 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 issue and, and you, c you will never be able to explain every single technical uh, uh, decision to, to, to the normal people. But you have to try to go to the extent possible in order if you're serious about about good governance and, and yes I, I just I can see more hands I just want to react to that I think it's really a significant point I think I think that um, 
the, that in a sense the accessibility, the ease of, of, of being able to pump out information on the internet is a challenge in itself. Because unless that information is conceived of and disseminated and structured on the basis of a clear understanding of principles of transparency and governance and participation, it just becomes overwhelming and contributes to the information overload that we all suffer from. Plus it can exclude people who, who do not access or do not have sufficient access to that. Um, I can see there are more hands in the audience. Um, Bill Graham, are you willing to wait and then respond? And I know Bill Drake also. Can we have two more people speak? Keep your comments very brief, please. If you've got the mic, go for it. Introduce yourself. Okay, thanks. Uh, the code of uh, good governance or the practice in good uh, internet governance or the guidelines for good uh, internet governance, for me, it is more of political issue than economical or technical. So taking into account the role of parliaments in the society as a legislative for legislative drafting, representations, and oversight function, I think they have a, st uh, a strategic role, actually, o and also responsibility and uh, power to develop and, uh, uh, and uh, also to adopt this uh, framework or initiative. So I think you know th uh, uh, there must be some kind of mechanism to actively involve this uh, uh, parliament uh, uh, institutions uh, to, to own and play their strategic role. Okay, thank you. Um, next. The Shuttleworth Foundation from South Africa. Um, I wanted to, to make, I think, two observations about, about the issue of technical complexity and the really vexing problem this poses in terms of how to have meaningful, broader political participation. I think one observation, really following on, I think something which I think it was Thomas made about um, how difficult it is sometimes to understand some of the institutions when you get into. I think you gave the ITU as an example. I've got more familiarity with the ISO, and it, it's clear when you start to interact with institutions like this that there are swamp guides. Right? There are swamp guides who have grown up in the institution over a number of years. And they are the ones who know that go on, what there goes on. There are also swamp things, swamp guides and swamp things. Swamp Different guides. monsters. <laughs> swamp th and swamp things, yes. So I think th that's the one observation. I, and I don't think the fact that internet governance is a really complicated, difficult problem necessarily should mean that the institutions that govern it should be equally um, convoluted and complicated. I think just my uh, final point, also dealing with complexity, if we want people who are not necessarily the world's leading expert in all the technical detail to have the meaningful political voice that they should have, I think we need to acknowledge that what is required isn't, isn't so much the governance of the internet as such, but more the governance of the people who govern the internet. That's a to all those who have been active in developing uh, this code of good governance for the internet governance. And I, my question is regarding uh, the further process. First of all, I think it is already uh, quite important that this is a code which has been developed by several stakeholders, including an NGO like APC. No, uh, just sorry to interrupt you. Um, well, just, just the, the code does not exist yet. Yes, no problem. But we are, um, we are, and, and with your participation, trying to frame a strategy for developing such a code. Okay. And I see that the IGF has had an important role, like Rio and now. Uh, but the question still remains, uh, in, the, in the end, uh, this obviously should have a wider uh, coverage uh, than just uh, Europe, and therefore how are you intending uh, to involve uh, the wider community in order also uh, to create a wider ownership uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, code, which I think is extremely important, but which should serve, so to say, the whole of internet governance, uh, which we uh, have assembled here in this forum. And here I see, for example, the problem that uh, the United Nations as such are not really evolved, so how to bring them in, uh, and also how to bring other regional, other regions in, etc., etc. So uh, I think it's very important that you took the lead, uh, but as uh, this is a global forum, 
the question poses itself like with other codes which have been proposed and which are very important, how to globalize that? Thank you. To, to, res to react, to respond some of the discussion, but also to, to indicate uh, um, their interest in participating in this initiative, to this exploration of, of mapping and, and um, of moving towards some set of, of, of common principles and hopefully some commonly agreed code of good practice. And, and um, yes, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then if you want to make any closing remarks. Um, well, Graham, I want to start with you because you've had comments that you've wanted to make for a while. Thanks again. Uh, one of the points I think actually relates to what the gentleman from Shuttleworth had to say. Uh, you know, indeed a lot of the work that, uh, that is done in the uh, inter strictly internet uh, institutions in g terms of governance <coughs> does touch on the uh, technical. And uh, there's been a, a real culture of how this online interaction, this consultative uh, open process has developed. I want to say as someone who's uh, relatively recently come into this environment from a more conventional government environment, that culture is also a real uh, challenge that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed uh, intersectorally, if I can put it. Uh, the, the interaction in the internet community tends to be a little uh, rough, even ver verging on ill-mannered sometimes. Uh, it tends to be re highly dependent on asynchronous or, or not real-time communications, which can be difficult if you're used to sitting in a meeting, uh, learning to, to work across time mm -hmm. zones across the mm -hmm. world and over a period of time through uh, various electronic tools is a real challenge. So I think uh, okay. it's an interesting point and it's something that needs to be looked at in, in uh, doing this mapping exercise and this looking at a code is do, does there need to be some kinds of codes of uh, uh, conduct mm -hmm. and uh, addressing cultural issues. Uh, you know, certainly there are many cultures in the world that are not uh, that as open in their communications as others. There are gender differences and so on. Uh, and just closing uh, on your final question, I think this is a worthwhile process and something we'd be uh, interested in participating in at some level to in future. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you men mentioned gender. We haven't touched on it, but I think it is also um, a real challenge in, in this area. Um, Massimiliano, do you want to respond? Well, again, um, all the, the issues that, that have been brought up are um, certainly relevant to this to this uh, process of thinking. So, I, I suppose they will be they will be incorporated. Maybe um, on the question of the uh, the process going forward. Um, of course, ICANN would equally be interested in, in following up on, on this and exploring what the next steps might be. Um, one element I would uh, probably like to see incorporated in the, in the thinking is um, the demand side of, of all this. We have t been talking of the effort that should be done on the part of the organization that are currently involved in internet governance to make uh, more information available to the right people, so trying to address specific needs of the different kind of public that is interested in, this, in these issues. But I think it would also be very helpful for, for those organizations to have some sense, some better sense, because of, of course we get some, some information about what people are interested in via our standard channel of communication. It would be interesting to have some, some feedback about what kind of information the different <coughs> public would be interested in because especially um, given the, the technical nature of a number of issues, it would be, and uh, bearing in mind the question of cost, because each exercise in producing information has a cost, and we are using uh, resources that come from the community, so we are not using our own money, we are using the money of the community, so we, we have to be accountable on how we use these resources in the best possible way. So it would be interesting for us to have also some information about the demand uh, of uh, information that we are trying to address via this code of conduct. Paul. 
Yes, thank you. Um, in answer to the question about whether we would be interested in, in participating in a comparative study, um, from the NRO point of view, uh, I represent the top of, uh, of a pyramid of, of bottom-up uh, processes and organisations. So I won't speak for the other RIRs, but speaking for APNIC itself, I think uh, certainly we'd be we'd be very interested um, from two perspectives. I mean, we are actually, frankly, as you, you've probably told, uh, gathered, we are, we are quite proud within uh, the NRO of the models that we've developed and, and the success of those models in, uh, in an open and participatory uh, bottom-up uh, decision-making uh, process and how that's evolved over the years. And we, we really do enjoy it when we're occasionally um, referred to as, uh, uh, described as uh, examples of best practice in, in internet governance in this, in this regard. But um, uh, rather than uh, sitting on our laurels, uh, I think we're also, we really are interested in continually uh, evolving, continually updating ourselves on the expectations of the bigger and broader community of stakeholders that are, that are taking an interest in this, in this area. Um, and I think that, uh, that participating in a study like this and seeing the results of a study like this would really would, uh, would inform us uh, very much and help us uh, in, in particular, amongst other things, to, um, as I mentioned before, prioritise the needs of, um, that, that are out there in terms of the, um, the types of uh, shortcomings we might have or the most, the most valuable, cost-effective sorts of developments that we might take. So, yes, the, the, I think the short answer is, is yes. And uh, if I can make a, a final comment, um, I think the, um, I'm quite interested in the, in the uh, use of the Aarhus Convention here, uh, or the reference to it, because the internet itself is, uh, is often described as an ecosystem, and, li and like the natural ecosystem, the internet is, is based on really a very, a very um, uh, rather small set of quite uh, simple, minimal raw, raw materials. And out of those raw materials on the internet, as, as like in the, in the physical environment, you have incredible complexity that, that arises, and it arises spontaneously in far-flung corners of the entire entire system. There is not one uh, party that is, is look, looking after the environment, nor nor the internet itself. But there are a whole lot of human actors within both of those environments, uh, which can work constructively or otherwise, can uh, are working in all sorts of different manners and in different dimensions. And so I think I, I think potentially the Aarhus Convention might have an interesting, um, uh, more than a poetic parallel, but it's got a, at least that, uh, to me, in, uh, in reference to, to internet governance as well. So, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thomas. Thank you. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's not enough time to answer the in in interesting questions because I would like to make two, two final points uh, which I think are, are, are important. One thing that we haven't discussed yet is, and I think it's a crucial question of, if you talk about governance, is the question of financing. Because through financing, you, you, you govern things. In my country, for instance, we have, a, uh, it's the people who decide on every level w how much the taxes are, what the fees are for services that you get. And through financings, we tell, we tell the administration what they can do and what they can't do. So it, it's the people who more or less directly define the scope of the services and the efficiency they, they expect through, through giving the money. So the question is, and, and, and I think this is also part of transparency, how is ISOC being financed? How is the ITU being financed? How is ICANN being financed? And, and for instance, if you take the ITU, they are financed by governments and by private sector entities. There are some governments who finance a lot more than others. Does this have an influence on, on, on the way uh, 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 the ITU is, 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 is working? Does the, the way that ICANN is financed, by whom, uh, who are the stakeholders that are behind, behind this money uh, of which ICANN uh, uh, lives, or who are the stakeholders that finance the members that finance uh, ISOC and so on? I think these are questions that are crucial in order to create transparency and, 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 and to, to allow people to understand uh, wh where the, the views also come from, because uh, many times it's not only about a nice, beautiful world, but it's also about uh, economic interest, and, and this is a natural thing, but it has to be transparent in my way. This is point one. With regard to the question on, on the way forward, I think you, you made two proposals in, in your text. I think one key element for me, apart from that there has to be uh, some kind of a uh, willingness of, of the institutions that are involved in the governance of the internet to participate, it also needs uh, an active involvement of governments, because if the governments do not care, nothing will happen because it's, it's, it's the, the pressure has to come from there as well. So uh, um, uh, I, I think you, 
you should really try to, to, to uh, get government uh, representatives involved in, in, in this work. And I mean, the Council of Europe is, of, of course, uh, uh, for the European region, it, it's a very good interface because they have a lot of expertise in, 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 in governance. They're discussing uh, participatory issues about e-democracy and so on and so forth. So that the, there you are at the right point. But through that, you could do some outreach. But it would be good to have also some governance, uh, governments from other uh, uh, regions of the world, like yours or, or uh, others. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Just Bear with us for a few minutes. I want to ask Bill Drake and David Suter if they have some closing reflections, and then I will hand over to Hans Hansel from the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe to make closing remarks. Bill Drake. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just say three things in response to this. Um, I could say <coughs> quite a few more. Um, first of all, I guess my one hesitation about this would be I wish we could consider expanding the scope a little bit beyond just internet governance to ICT global governance. Because there are lots of cases where decisions are being made um, in international institutions and in other contexts that shape uh, the ability of the public globally to communicate and to employ information that are not just specifically internet governance. And when you talk about internet governance, then you open up all the uh, existential questions about who is or isn't doing internet governance and can get some pushback from people who say, well then, I'm not doing internet governance, so don't look at me. Um, but I think that there's actually a, a broader need than just uh, IG. Uh, I would put it in a larger nexus. If you think, for example, of the work being done on spectrum in the ITU, it's enormously important to the future of the global information society. Most people would not consider global spectrum management to be IG. And so then it's off the map by, by definition. Development programs and so on. There are a lot of aspects of global ICT policy that really are very consequential and which would benefit from transparency and inclusive participation, but which wouldn't be uh, readily folded under IG. Secondly, on the financing. Um, Thomas mentioned the ITU. Uh, who finances the ITU? Us. Taxpayers and ratepayers to the telecom companies that pay fees. So we're paying twice, um, as well as people who buy manufacturing equipment. Um, and yet, this is an organization that, unlike the rest of the UN, basically makes it very, very difficult for anybody outside the organization to get ac access to the information or to participate, unless they are a paid, uh, vested organization with a real stake. So that's an issue. Uh, money is always an issue, and I think it provides a reasonable point of entry for suggesting that uh, there should be openness and transparency. A last point I would make though, I think it's worth being optimistic about this. As I said at the outset, um, you know, it is generally speaking easier to uh, make arguments about procedural fairness that will have some traction than it is to plunge into a lot of the more difficult and, and um, divisive substantive issues. And uh, we have seen already that the WISIS process, by virtue of being as multi-stakeholder as, as it was, and it wasn't fully multi-stakeholder, nevertheless catalyzed developments in a lot of organizations. Uh, ICANN clearly has, as a consequence of, of WISIS, taken a number of steps to increase its transparency, has been much more sensitized to those kinds of issues. I think the same is true with a number of other organizations. And most interestingly, Bill Graham is sitting here with me, um, a, a coalition of civil society organizations that APC also has been involved in uh, has been working with the OECD alongside the international technical community on uh, the involvement of, of uh, those groups in the work of the OECD with regard to the internet. And we had a ministerial meeting in Seoul where the Secretary General of the OECD got up and said, we think that there should be um, inclusion now of these groups that have not historically had a formal seat at the table at the OECD. And in a couple of weeks in Paris, they're going to have a meeting where they're going to review the formal proposal, uh, including texts that were submitted by the Civil Society Coalition and ISOC on behalf of the technical community to give us seats at the table alongside the business community and the trade union. Now that's an example of here's a fairly important international organization that has had a great deal of impact on a lot of the thinking on global ICT policy, uh, which is now saying basically, 
we're willing to work with you. Uh, post WISIS, they, there is a recognition that opening up and becoming more uh, um, interactive, particularly around internet issues, is really, really desirable. So I think that we see signs of change and hope and we can leverage these and work with these kinds of organiza organizations and try and build on the successes we're having. Being Thanks, American, Bill. could you say yes, we can? <laughs> <laughs> and being from Chicago, I can say yes, we can. <laughs> How about that? Um, David, do you want to add anything? We've got to finish. Okay, one or two, <coughs> one or two quick things. Um, firstly, I think I'd probably say that um, what we have here is a complex set of issues, and um, I've gained quite a lot from this uh, session today about some of those issues, but I'd say they are a complex set of issues. I'd have reservations, Bill, about um, broadening to a wider ICT governance debate. As, as some of you will know, I've worked on the wider ICT um, uh, international governance issues for the G8 uh, dot force in, uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, and um, I suspect uh, here that I would say that um, it's going to be a lot easier to move things forward by thinking within a smaller group than it is within a larger group. Um, of the points that are made, I think I would uh, agree very much with the emphasis on the demand side that was made a few minutes ago. Um, I'd probably say, in summary, that um, information, requi information is required for participation, but it's not sufficient. Um, and participation is informal as well as formal, so presence is not um, uh, an indicator necessarily of participation. Um, and that in terms of governance as a whole, um, good governance is really about looking for, um, a go good governance is good because it's relevant to what is being governed. It's not a matter of looking for a simple formula. But I think that's probably uh, a broad kind of consensus around here as well. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. Hans, will you please close for us? And <coughs> thanks to all the speakers from me. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to thank all the participants. I think it was a very constructive and rich debate. Uh, and also, thank you, Anne Red, for guiding the debate so professionally. Uh, in particular, uh, I think the, I believe that this discussion shows that uh, while each uh, entity organization that has been presented here uh, have developed procedures and techniques related to information, participation, and accountability in their respective areas. Uh, they're obviously different uh, between their different organizations, but uh, I'm not here to criticize any of the methods. I, I think they all seem very appropriate for uh, the, the needs that each organization have, and uh, they seem to work. Um, however, internet governance is also a concern of, of governments, and, and some governments are taking uh, active steps to implement measures related to internet. Uh, as you know, uh, some governments are quite restrictive, uh, but also some governments, they take uh, positive uh, steps in order to use uh, internet in their governance. And if you remember from yesterday, the union minister, Mr. Rai, told us that uh, uh, the authorities uh, would face penalties should they not provide information that's required uh, on, online. And this is a similar thinking that we have in the Aarhus uh, uh, Convention, that authorities are obliged to provide information. However, it, uh, I think uh, also it, it's not uh, the each and every uh, organization. I think there is now uh, an underlying concern in the major institutional set up for, int uh, for internet uh, governance. Uh, I attended a workshop this morning uh, on ICANN and the improving institutional confidence in ICANN. Uh, we in, in the plenary, we are talking about the advisor board of I IGF and we are also talking about the very future of internet governance uh, forum after 2010. So uh, my conclusion is that uh, uh, the internet and its governance is made up of a large number of organizations, standards bodies, and governments. And it's very difficult to get a complete overview of the picture and how it works and interrelates. And in, in view of the concern about this governance, I, I believe that the quality, uh, inclusiveness, uh, and, and of internet governance would be improved by making information about decision-making processes and practice more open and more widely available and to fa facilitate more effective participation by more stakeholders. Mm -hmm. 
And I was very pleased to hear today that uh, I think there is a lot of support uh, to develop a, a code or good practice, and uh, that should be based on the uh, WISIS principles and the existing arrangements in the internet government institutions. Uh, so I, I think uh, half the door is open. I think uh, also that this, uh, such an in initiative would be very timely and contribute uh, constructively to the future internet governance solutions. Uh, in, the, in this context, the experience of developing and implementing uh, s such a uh, uh, solution, I, I think the Aarhus Convention could serve as a benchmark and inspiration for us work. Obviously, as has been said before, it's not something we just copied uh, directly off. Uh, having said this, uh, I do not believe this is an easy task. I think the first aim is to uh, make it applicable uh, across a broad range of decision-making bodies, uh, which means that the code must be expressed in broad and general terms. Uh, however, I also do not think it should be a very long and detailed document, but should be restricted to a couple of pages. And also think this should be uh, aimed at achieving consistency between countries. So how do I envisage a way forward? Uh, I've been working with this uh, together with the Council of Europe, uh, APC, <coughs> Professor Suter, for quite some time now. We are a bit geared up and we would like to, uh, to, to move on. Uh, I think we should pick up on the proposal by Mr. Suter, and the first step should be to uh, make an assessment and mapping of existing arrangement in a number of uh, selected internet governance institutions. Uh, those I would like to agree and participate in such an uh, exercise. However, I think it's also equally important uh, that uh, not only listen to the institutions, but also listen very carefully to the users. In this case, I believe a bottom-up approach is as important as a top-down. Uh, following such a mapping exercise, a small working group could develop a work plan, which could then be presented for discussion in the wider internet community. Myself, uh, I'm very excited about this initiative, and I think this is an opportunity that should not be missed. I think there's a possibility here to really realize the visions of the WISIS process. And uh, to be very practical and go forward, should there be support for such an in initiative, I'm uh, prepared to host a uh, working group meeting on this topic at the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, with that, I like to close and I'd like to thank all the participants and thank you Anjat for your chairmanship. Thank you. Great. Sincere apologies. Thanks everyone.